Okay, we're going to get started. Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to our lightning lecture on COVID-19 and health systems with Professor Neelam Beecham. Thank you to all the prospective students that are joining us today for a teaser of the Master of Science in Global Health program here at the UCSF Institute for Global Health Sciences. My name is Haley Reeves, and I'm a 2018 graduate from the master's program, and I'm now working as a program assistant for both the master's and PhD in global health programs. The format of today will be a short lecture from Professor Feacham, and afterward we will have a Q&A where you're welcome to ask any questions you may have about the lecture or about the program and the admissions process more broadly. Please feel free to post your questions in the Q&A function throughout the session. Without further ado, I would like to introduce Professor Neelam Feacham, an associate professor at UCSF who teaches the Comparative Health Systems and Financing course for our master's and PhD programs. Lady Feacham has over 35 years of experience in health policy, financing, and management of healthcare systems. She has served in many roles, including as a senior health financing and policy advisor at the World Health Organization, founder and CEO of the Healthcare Redesign Group, Senior Vice President for Global Access and Alliances, and more. Please join me in welcoming Professor Feacham. Thank you, Haley. I'm delighted to be here, and um, I hope to meet many of you in person next year. As Haley said, this is really just a short talk, a teaser talk, um, on health systems for prospective students. So let me share my screen. In this very brief talk, I'm going to give you a flavor of why health systems are so important and why they really underpin everything that we do in global health. The COVID-19 pandemic has brought the weaknesses of health systems around the world into sharp relief. Some countries, including some with very lavishly funded health systems, have done incredibly well, and others that are spending much less have done much better. Um, sorry, lavishly funded have not done very well, like the US, which has really come up short. I'll start by saying a few words about health systems and a few words about COVID-19. Then we'll look at the collision between the two. According to the World Health Organization, the health system includes all the activities whose primary purpose is to promote, restore, or maintain health. And this includes everything from wellness to illness and in settings from clinics to hospitals to homes. There are two big components of a health system, and both of them are incredibly important when we're talking about fighting infectious diseases. The first is public health. And this focuses on population health services, such as disease surveillance, for example. Health care, on the other hand, focuses on coverage and provision of services to individuals. Now, some activities have an overlap between the two, and you'll see in that intersection would be things like mass, uh, mass vac vaccination campaigns, or more recently, like COVID testing. Now, in terms of funding, public health really gets short trips. In the U.S., we spend only about 3% of our government health budget on public health. So it's hard to get a real handle on this because of the decentralization of public health functions to localities. But I think you'll agree that as our recent experience shows, it is clearly woefully inadequate. In my course at UCSF, I talk about some hard truths about healthcare systems. So what do you think is the basis for how we organize health systems around the world? Well, we'd love to believe that it has something to do with evidence, but it has much more to do with society's values, its politics, and its history. And then hopefully the evidence gets considered. And all three of these have been in vivid display in how countries have handled the COVID-19 pandemic. Now a brief word about COVID-19. You guys have been hearing about COVID for the last 11 months, so I'm not gonna give you a scientific lecture on this and I'm not really the right person to do that. But I wanna give you four big perspectives and context. 
first, we can note that the current pandemic was predictable and it was predicted by numerous public health and infectious disease experts. We knew it would happen. We knew it would be caused by a respiratory virus, and we knew that the virus would come from wild or domestic animals, and we knew it would cause illness and death on a very large scale. We also knew that the economic consequences would be measured in trillions of dollars. And yet we were wholly unprepared with really disastrous consequences. Second, as you'll soon see, there are enormous differences in the impact of COVID-19 among countries, far larger than we would have expected. They indicate that national policies, leadership, and national preparedness really do matter. Third, I'm afraid this is not the end. This pandemic has a long way to go still and it will get worse before it gets better. And finally, many experts believe that this is a dry run for a more deadly pandemic that could come at any time. Just as we're seeing once in a century climatic events that are happening several times a decade, we can also expect to see pandemics of this type more frequently. Now you've heard a lot about the coronavirus and its characteristics. And as you know, the virus originated in bats in Southeast China, and it probably spread through the humans through some other animal. Initially, the pangolin was suspected, but it denied this, and it played the cuteness card. So the search is still on to find the culprit. What, what's the virus been up to since we first saw it in Wuhan 11 months ago? Well, it's taken off with a vengeance. And as you can see in this slide, we have over 50 million cases globally. 10 million of these are just in the US. We also have well over 1.2 million deaths. And the numbers are rising rapidly, as you can see from the steepness of the curve. When we're looking within countries, we're seeing some distinct patterns emerge. One is waves of infection, and then followed by waves of hospitalization and death. Often the subsequent waves are bigger than the first wave, as the virus spreads among susceptibles and societies become less vigilant and kind of tired of dealing with an infectious disease. And as you can see, we're in the mu third much larger wave here in the United States. Also within countries, the virus has exposed the dark sides of social inequity. Disadvantaged groups have suffered much higher rates of sickness and death than the general population. Now this particular slide is from the UK, but the US and other countries show similar patterns. Singapore, which was initially lauded for its response to the pandemic, lost control of its cases by ignoring its large immigrant workforce, which was housed in overcrowded apartment blocks. I really hope that this is a wake up call to all societies. But the big revelation comes when we compare countries around the world. Some countries have done much better than others to a degree that we could not have predicted. As you're gonna learn in the Global Health Program, Good epidemiology requires skepticism about data, and country comparisons can be tricky. But we're looking here at cumulative deaths per million attributed to COVID-19. These are almost thoroughly underreported because of the very different ways that countries count and attribute deaths. I've seen some excess mortality figures that show much higher death rates in many countries. I selected a few wealthy countries to compare with highly sophisticated healthcare and data systems. But even within this elite group, there are clearly winners and losers. At the top here, you can see countries that have death rates of between 600 and over 700 deaths per million. And at the bottom, you can see countries that have death rates between 1 and 20 per million. 
from the top to the bottom, there is much more than a thousand fold difference. Now that's really remarkable. The German death rate, for example, is less than one fifth of what the US death rate is. And yet Germany spends roughly half of what the US does on its health system per person per year. But look at Singapore here, which has a death rate that is less than five per million compared to ours with over 700 per million. And Singapore spends about a quarter of what we do on healthcare per capita. But the real winner in this whole story is Taiwan. Taiwan has a death rate of less than one death per million. Actually, the, the official number is 0.3. And they spend less than 15% of what the US does on healthcare. So clearly, the amount of spending is not making, it does not account for these differences in mortality rates. So what does separate the winners from the losers? Well, this is going to be a much debated topic, I know, for many years to come, and the subject of numerous PhD theses and capstones, and perhaps even yours. So let me share a few things, though, that jump out at me, at, for me, at least at this initial stage. First, Asia was prepared. Because of their experiences with SARS in 2003 and MERS in 2012, they knew what to do, and they were ready to do it. In Europe and the Americas, we could have followed their lead, for example, by using some of their validated tests and contact tracing protocols, but most countries chose not to do that. Second, the winners followed the three C's of good communication, clear, consistent, and scientifically correct messaging from politicians and public health agencies. And this generated trust among the population and increased compliance with public health policies. Third, countries that were more successful followed the time-honored public health protocol of test, trace, and isolate. They did it quickly and they executed on it very well. And choosing the right public health policy really did matter in this case. A few countries, such as Sweden and initially the UK and the US, embarked on a policy of herd immunity. It proved deadly, and it's been hard for them to recover. Did quality of care account for any of the differences that we see in death rates between these wealthy countries? Well, we really don't know yet. We know that healthcare supply chains failed in many countries. And, but we haven't yet dug into the details of whether successful countries addressed these failures more quickly or whether there were staff shortages or significant differences in care protocols. All of these countries, as you may remember, have well-funded and strong healthcare systems. And all of them, except the United States, have achieved universal health coverage. So this will be a topic that will need quite a bit of research in the future. And as I mentioned to you earlier of the importance of values, and here cultural values really did matter and do matter. Societies that value solidarity are doing much better than those that value individual freedoms above all else. And finally, and I'd say arguably most importantly, leadership really matters. Let me show the leaders of some similar countries and how their country has fared so far in this pandemic. So first here we have the special relationship and it has held up as far as this pandemic is concerned. These countries which followed similar policies, at least initially, are ending up with similar deadly results. They're neck and neck competing for one of the highest death rates in wealthy countries. Here are two Scandinavian neighbors, Sweden and Norway, which share a long border and usually work together on big issues. Yet, Norway had to close its border with Sweden earlier this year, and you can see why. 
Sweden's policy of herd immunity has resulted in a death rate that's 10 times as high as Norway's. The Swedish prime minister recently became part of the herd and he's now in self-isolation. And here we have the neighborhood, France and Germany. Despite recent surges, Germany is doing much better than France. France's COVID-19 death rate is four and a half times that of Germany's. And finally, two sister countries in the South Pacific, Australia and New Zealand. Australia's death rate is seven times that of New Zealand. Now, as future public health professionals, I'll leave it to you to spot any patterns. Thank you so much for listening. Stay safe and wear a mask, and I'll stay on to answer any questions you might have along with Haley. Thanks so much. Thank you so much, Professor Feacham, for such a thought-provoking and exciting lecture. Um, we're now going to open things up for a question and answer period, so please feel free to put your questions into the Q&A. I saw some, uh, some great comments. One is that it looks like women are great leaders, and indeed they are. They definitely are. Um, okay, so then the next question is, do you see education level impacting or having a role in determining success in combating the virus? If so, how so? Um, I guess I'm not sure whether you mean the educational level of the entire population or... Um, I'm not sure what you mean by that, because I think we, we can also, if I had shown you some middle income countries and lower income countries that actually probably overall have less educational achievement than these wealthy countries, you would see that they may have done much better in the pandemic than some wealthy countries have. Okay, next question is, early on in your talk, you said you knew the pandemic was coming. What was the evidence? Well, infectious disease experts have known that the pandemic is coming for a long time. And um, they have been predicting it, and there's a number, a number of articles that have come out and, and several books that came out about the coming pandemic. Uh, and, and what they've been looking at is um, several factors, but one of them is the density of individuals uh, living with animals and how viruses are jumping from animals to humans because of this close relationship. And there are a number of other things as well. Um, but I can certainly offline suggest some books for you to read on that. Great. Thank you so much. We have a question from Dr. Sepulveda. Do you agree with me that women are better leaders than populist nativist men? <laughs> Absolutely, Dr. Sepulveda. <laughs> I agree with you. And I think my little dyads hopefully showed that really well. <laughs> Absolutely. Thanks so much. Um, okay, with the new administration in the U.S., how do you see the virus attack plan changing in the next year? Well, I think we're going to see much more of a focus on tried and true public health policies. Um, and, um, you know, you may have read from some of the UCSF experts on COVID who have reviewed the Biden plan and have really given it a thumbs up on how well it will control the virus. Great. Uh, could you expand on the low death rates in African countries, which mostly have low healthcare spending and weaker healthcare systems? So, I think there, we're going to have to dig more deeply into that. I don't think there's one clear answer. Um, one is th just the ability of data systems to keep track of who has COVID and who doesn't have COVID. Um, another may be the, the younger population demographic overall in some African countries. And I think a third that I would reflect on is that um, countries, just like many low-income countries, have been used to dealing 
with infectious diseases and epidemics. They have good surveillance programs set up for things like malaria and HIV AIDS. And I think some of them put those good public health surveillance programs to use early in, in identifying people who were infected and bringing them um, testing and, and taking them to isolation. So I think just the experience um, with public health infrastructure and using that infrastructure has been helpful as well. Great, thank you so much. Uh, okay, and the next question is about COVID versus SARS. So why did COVID spread so rapidly around the world, even more so than SARS did? It's just a much more infectious virus. Um, and, you know, coronaviruses, um, like all viruses, have different levels of in infection rate, which is called the R, uh, which is how many people are affected by one person that the virus affects. And um, COVID-19 had a much higher infection rate um, and an R than SARS did. Great. Um, do you have any recommendations on how to strengthen evidence based on national management and get away from politicizing COVID for hidden agendas? <laughs> <laughs> well, I would love to see that happen. I would love to see that happen. I think one of the things that strikes me is how little even wealthy countries uh, learn from each other. And I showed you France versus Germany um, and countries in, um, you know, in Europe or the U.S., which, you know, we had some time to wait before the virus really took off here. And yet we just did not share enough. And we didn't really look at what were the public health policies that were working. Uh, we tried to invent everything um, for our own society. And of course, part of that has to do with the cultural values of the society. Um, another has to do with the trust in government. Um, but I think it's something that we really need to dig into. And speaking of politicization, um, it's hard to understand why masks have become a political differentiator. Uh, Trump and Republicans seem to have rejected the science behind testing and masking. What are your thoughts on this? I don't know why it has become such a political issue either. I mean, I think it was clear from the very beginning from looking at how Asian countries have controlled the spread that masks really did make a difference. And yet I heard many, many people talk about, you know, well, we couldn't do this here because of freedom. You know, we believe in freedom and, you know, they, they just, we don't have the same cultural values. And I think some politicians just capitalized on that and make it, made it a raison d'etre to really the, the um, detriment of the entire population. A follow-up question from earlier. Why do you think women have handled this pandemic much better than men? <laughs> oh boy, I have no idea. I think this needs a capstone or a PhD thesis research paper. Agree on that. Um, <laughs> Okay, clearly there are differences in success rates. Can, clearly the differences in success rates can be partially attributed to cultural differences that affect adoption of successful policies, such as the USA's individualistic culture that you mentioned. Um, how would you recommend countries such as the US overcome this? Um, well, I mean, I think that one of the things that I, 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 the president-elect Biden is going to do is to put out a plan, a cohesive plan. And I think one of the things that he's going to have to do is strong and consistent communication and messaging and really dealing with how this is not an issue of individual freedom, but this is an issue of caring about other people and caring about yourself. Um, and I, I think there's many ways that you can convince people. And I think overall, Americans would be willing to um, take a more collective approach if they knew that there was consistent messaging and that we were all going to do this together. So um, I think he's gonna have a challenge given our culture and also given the way this has been politicized. Um, but I think that's all he can do is uh, really make the strong scientific case.
Great, thank you so much. Um, is there any action we as a society can take to ensure that if the new vaccine comes out the next year, it will reach everyone in America? Um, boy, um, that is a very, very big question. And I think that there's gonna be a lot of experts looking at that. Um, but I mean, of course, one thing we can do is make sure that everybody's covered. Because in the US, of course, we have this unique problem that we haven't achieved universal health coverage yet. Um, so we have to make sure that this can be made available free to everyone. Okay, how does the mortality rate in poorer countries compare? And why do some countries like Vietnam, Thailand, and India show such low numbers? Well, I think Vietnam and Thailand are part of the East Asian group that have really been able to keep their spread of the virus in control. Um, with India, um, there are a couple of, couple of issues. One is the virus has really taken off in India, although even though the death rates are low. And I think part of that may be how deaths are attributed. It's very difficult um, in India is very, uh, very diverse and just um, public private um, system to really count death accurately. So I think we're gonna, you know, that may account for some of the difference. And of course we also, they have a much younger population. So that may be another reason for some of those differences. Great, thanks so much. And it looks like we have a few more. Um, thanks so much for answering all these questions, Professor Peachin. Uh, how have differences in economic and societal systems played into differences in COVID outcomes? For example, capitalism versus socialism versus more autocratic cities. Um, well, definitely if you think of socialism as universal health coverage, then it's been a very important factor. Um, and uh, you can see in some of the European countries that have done very well that that has played a, a, a big difference. But I don't think we can see big differences just based on that because I showed you countries that you could consider having good universal health coverage and socialist systems like uh, the UK doing much worse than Germany. So I, I don't know if I can really make any comparisons between capitalism versus socialism. I do think that countries that um, have stronger political systems that can take quick action have been able to do better. And, and I say that, because, but I don't want to imply that Asian countries that have done better are autocratic systems. I mean, we see many democratic Asian countries having done better. One of the things they did when they dealt, after they dealt with SARS and MERS is that they put into place emergency preparedness um, protocols that were immediately activated when, uh, when um, COVID-19 became a pandemic. And they were able to then take what we would consider uh, national security kinds of actions, like requiring people to wear masks, like um, surveillance in terms of cell phones um, and tracking of cases. Great, thank you so much. It looks like we just have about one minute left. So um, I just wanna give everybody a reminder that the um, deadline for the master's application for the priority deadline is December 1st, and then the regular deadline is February 15th. And please feel free to visit our website to um, see all of the uh, different requirements for application, a few of which are listed here. Um, I just want to say again, thank you so much to Professor Feacham for such a great talk today. It was really um, nice to hear from you and it was really interesting. So thank you so much. Thank you so much.